Margaret of Navarre was one of the most educated women in Europe during the early part of the 16th century. Daughter of a poor cousin to the King of France, she went on to become sister to the King and one of the key players within the royal court of one of the most powerful French monarchs in history. She was an author, poet, wife and mother, but most interestingly, she was a staunch defender of the new Protestant learning that was beginning to make inroads into Europe. She was an amazing woman. Join us as we take a look at her incredible story. Margaret of Navarre had two great loves in her life, God and her brother Francis. Margaret was born on the 2nd of April, 1492 at Angoulême. Her mother had made a pilgrimage to a famous shrine in France to plead with God for a boy. Now, during the time that Margaret was born, the King of France, Charles VIII, did not have any children. And Margaret's father, the Count of Angoulême, was a distant cousin of the King. Now, unlike in England or Spain or uh, most other European countries, France had a special law, the Salic Law. The Salic Law dictated that only males could take the throne of France. That meant that if the king did not have sons, then the throne would pass to his nearest male relative. Margaret's father, the Count of Angoulême, was in direct line to the French throne uh, by virtue of his relationship with the king. Uh, he was known as the Prince of the Blood. Princes of the Blood uh, were generally male heirs uh, that may have been uh, first cousins or second cousins or even third cousins, uh, but because there were no uh, female, there were only female heirs in, um, in front of them, uh, the, the throne would pass to them. When Margaret was born, her parents didn't make a very big fuss over her. She was, after all, just a girl. Uh, her mother, Louise, named her Margaret, which means Pearl, and uh, the celebrations after she bo was born were quite muted. But two years after she was born, along came her brother, Francis, the much longed for heir and the hope uh, that the Angoulême family had to one day uh, acquire the throne. Now, it's really interesting. Margaret's mother devoted her life to her son, Francis. It would have been easy for Margaret to get jealous of her brother, but taking a cue from her mother, Margaret herself built her life around her baby brother. She adored Francis, and the relationship that the two of them had was very, very close. When their father, the Count of Angoulême, died, uh, it was just Margaret, her mother Louise, and Francis. And when King Louis XII of France died without any male heirs, the throne of France passed to Francis. Francis had married King Louis's daughter, Claude, and he became Francois I, or Francis I of France. Francis I uh, was, is probably one of the most powerful French kings, definitely the most powerful French king during the, the, the 16th century. He was a formidable opponent, and the French king, Francois, uh, the, the emperor of, of Spain, or the king of Spain and the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, uh, and the king of England uh, were formidable enemies, they were rivals, uh, but they also had an interesting alliance going on between them. It was considered one of the most golden periods of European history. Margaret, uh, unlike most other French women, was highly educated. She was fluent in French, Spanish, English, Hebrew, and Latin, and was conversant in some German and Italian. She was given a broad education in philosophy, literature, history, and theology. That was unusual, uh, but it was something that her father, her mother especially, saw too. She was educated alongside her brother. Uh, and, as a, and as a result, uh, he had an, an unusual amount of confidence in her and in her intellectual abilities. When she was 17 years old, she married the Duke of Alençon, uh, who was well-placed uh, politically within the nobility. And generally, uh, the daughters of kings or the sisters of kings were given in marriage to other monarchs 
Equinox to create an alliance between those two countries. So, for example, uh, the daughter of Isabella and Ferdinand of Spain, Catherine of Aragon, was married off to uh, Arthur Tudor, who was supposed to be king of, of England. And then when he died, she was married off to his brother, Henry VIII, the famous uh, Henry VIII, who had six wives. She was the first of his six wives. Uh, similarly, Henry's sister, Mary, was married off to the much older Louis XII of France uh, in a last ditch effort to uh, produce a male heir. And so it was very common for daughters or sisters of a monarch to be married off to, um, to kings or monarchs of, of other countries. Margaret instead was married to the Duke of Alençon, possibly because her mother and her brother wanted her close to home. She was married to him for 16 years, but they had no children. Uh, when her brother Francis was crowned king in January 1515, Margaret took on a key role within his court. Francis's wife, Claude, was chronically ill and she was often unable to attend to her duties as queen consort. So what happened was Margaret often functioned in the role of queen consort beside her brother. She traveled with him, she hosted events at court, she helped with diplomatic negotiations. She was cultured, educated, a patron of the arts, but also she was an incredibly shrewd political operator. And she often acted in the capacity of a political advisor to her brother. Now, Margaret's presence was incredibly invaluable at the French court, um, and she brought to it uh, not just culture and education, but, what, but a kind of diplomatic savvy that made the French court one of the most celebrated courts in Europe. But this was not the only thing that Margaret was involved in. Margaret soon became involved in the new learning or the new reformed theology. These reformist ideas were beginning in France in 1512 with a man named Jacques Lefebvre. Jacques Lefebvre was uh, the, the hair, uh, chair of theology uh, at the University of Paris or the Sorbonne. And uh, he decided when he was about 70, he decided that he was going to write a book on the lives of the saints. Now, in order to get some research done, he decided to turn to the Bible because a lot of the saints um, that he wanted to write about were found in the Bible. When he decided to write about the life of Paul, he didn't just study the book of Acts, he started to read the writings of Paul and it revolutionized his life. Because he discovered in the book of Romans the very thing that Martin Luther would discover a few years in the future. Jacques Lefebvre discovered salvation by faith. Unlike Martin Luther, which made a massive uh, massive impact on Christendom by challenging the authority of the Pope, Lefebvre focused instead on the doctrine of, of salvation by faith um, as found in, in the Bible, and specifically in the writings of Paul. And uh, he started to teach these things in his classes at the university. Lefebvre had a bunch of really brilliant, gifted students in his classes. And as he started teaching them, they began to be revolutionized by his ideas. Um, a lot of them, like um, Martin Luther, uh, who would come in the future, uh, were struggling with uh, this idea of salvation. How am I supposed to be saved? One of Lefebvre's students that was particularly blessed uh, by his teaching was a young man by the name of William Farrell. Uh, Farrell loved uh, these truths of righteousness by faith, of salvation by faith that um, Lefebvre was teaching and he lapped them up. Uh, if you go to the Reformation wall today in Geneva, there are four large uh, marble statues that are carved into the wall there. And one of those four, uh, the one on the far left is William Farrell. He had a, a massive influence on John Calvin later when Calvin went to Geneva. Another uh, one of Lefebvre's students was Pierre Oliveton. Oliveton was uh, Calvin's cousin. It was because of Pierre Oliveton uh, that Calvin was convinced of, of the new learning of, of this beautiful truth of salvation by faith. Interestingly, Pierre Oliver Tong was um, the one to translate the Bible into French for the first time. So Lefebvre's students were these bright, brilliant reformers who went on to want to do something uh, about what they were learning. Another one of Lefebvre's students was William Brissonnet. Brissonnet um, and Margaret soon formed a friendship based on their mutual desire to see the church reformed. 
Now, it was Margaret who convinced her brother to name Brissonnet as bishop of the town of Meaux. At Meaux, Brissonnet used his position to gather together a group of reformist thinkers. Lefebvre, Farel, there were a, just a bunch of them that got together and started preaching this new teaching of salvation by faith. What happened as they began to preach is that they managed to plant a church. This was way before Luther had nailed his 95 Theses to the door of the castle church at Wittenberg. Interestingly, they planted what is most likely the first reformist congregation in France. And outside of the Waldensian churches in Italy, this was probably also one of the first reformist churches in Europe at the time. Now, Brissonnet and Margaret formed a relationship via correspondence. And Brissonnet started writing to Margaret and telling her about all the things that he was learning. Through his writings, Margaret, who was uh, well-versed in Latin and Greek, began to read the Bible for herself. And she was convicted about these truths of salvation by faith. Margaret began to lap them up and she began to understand one fundamental thing that really changed her life, that she was a, a sinner and Jesus and Jesus alone could save her and change her heart. Margaret wanted her brother to rise up as the defender of this new movement within Europe. Francis I was actually well positioned um, to be a defender of Protestantism in Europe if he chose to do that. Uh, at the time, uh, France was a formidable European superpower. France ha Fra and Francis had immense influence with the Pope, uh, with Henry VIII of England. He had a close relationship with him. Uh, they, he also had a close relationship with Charles V, uh, the emperor. Now, their relationships deteriorated over time and became quite prickly, uh, but Margaret felt that her brother could be a champion and a defender for this new reform movement. Now, Francis saw this reform movement as dangerous and subversive, but he felt that it was contained enough that he didn't need to concentrate any particular energy on it, but he kept an eye on it. He also indulged Margaret's fascination with it. Now, the main reason uh, behind this particular um, reservation towards the Reformation was the relationship between the French state and the Catholic Church. Now France, more than most other European nations, was particularly bound uh, to the Catholic Church and the French monarch received a lot of his power and his authority from the Pope. Now the way Francis saw this uh, was very simple. To throw off the Papal Church and to embrace this new reformist movement would jeopardize the throne of France and the power of the French monarchy. Francis, uh, more than most other French kings that had gone before him, really wanted absolute power. Right, um, And beyond this, uh, th what he saw was his desire for absolute power and this new movement kind of seemed to clash because this new movement was calling people to study the Bible for themselves. It was teaching them to be accountable to God alone for their conscience. Whereas what the papal church taught was that the people were accountable to the Pope, that their, their conscience was captive to the Pope and then to the king under the sovereignty of the Pope. This new movement, if embraced would teach people to think for themselves. And if they were taught to think for themselves, it would then promote religious liberty, which in turn could and would, um, as we see later in history, become a catalyst for democracy and religious liberty. Francis was far thinking enough to see this, and he was happy enough for his sister to dabble in it, but he would never allow France to become reformist because he saw it as a threat to absolutist, uh, an absolutist, um, absolutist state where, where the king uh, would have absolute power over the people. Now, within this, uh, within this climate, uh, Fran uh, Francis would often allow persecution against many of these reformers. He would allow it because he felt like there needed to be a balance. They shouldn't get 
too far out of control, but Margaret often intervened. Once, when Margaret was away from Paris, the priest from the Faculty of Theology at the university arrested one of her close friends who was a reformist. They dragged him through the streets, dumped him in a dungeon, and left him to languish there for weeks. Margaret heard about it, went to her brother, and came back, and her brother ordered her to order the release of this, this particular friend. Then, once he was released, he refused to stop preaching heresy. He was arrested again, and he was warned again, and because Margaret pleaded with her brother, he was released again. But again, he went out and kept preaching heresy. The third time that he was arrested, Francis told Margaret, enough is enough. He is spreading seditious views, um, and he was uh, arrested and then burned at the stake for the last time. Margaret was devastated, uh, but it was one of a, a few rare instances where she didn't get her way uh, and see one of her precious reformist friends uh, protected. It's really interesting because of Margaret's influence, there were so many reformists, including uh, the great and powerful John Calvin, uh, who were protected from, de from, from the stake. Um, and often when they had to flee from Paris, uh, they would find shelter within Margaret's dower lands, or uh, they were basically the lands that her brother gave her as a dowry um, in the Ducky of Berry. She even hosted Jacques Lefebvre in her home when he was feeble, and she provided a great deal of comfort. However, Margaret also often got herself um, into a whole bunch of hot water uh, because of um, what she taught and what she believed in. And much of that time, uh, she got into a lot of trouble with her husband, her second husband. So her first husband, uh, the Duke of Alençon, died. Um, and she married uh, Henri of Navarre. Henri of Navarre was a uh, childhood friend of her brother's. And he was also known uh, for two things. He was a womanizer and he had a quick temper. Around 1529, while Margaret was at the palace in Navarre, she did something that her husband had expressly forbidden. Now, Henri did not like reformist teaching. He knew that Margaret sheltered reformists. He knew that she had reformist leanings, but he didn't want any of that at his court. One day, Margaret had called her friend and spiritual mentor, Gerard Roussel, to her home um, in Navarre. And even though her husband did not like her uh, entertaining reformists, she got Roussel to preach for her. Now, while Roussel was preaching, her husband unexpectedly came home and discovered that there had been a Protestant church service, uh, a Protestant study group, in his basement. He slapped Margaret across the face for that infraction. Margaret, not one to be beaten down, immediately wrote to her brother and told him what her husband had done. Francis flew into a rage, came down to Navarre, and threatened Henri that if Henri ever laid a hand on his sister again, France would significantly reduce uh, Navarre uh, and its uh, standing as a nation. It was a really interesting political play that even though Francis himself didn't care much for the Reformation, he would not allow his sister's freedoms to be infringed upon. Margaret, soon after this, a couple of years after this, Margaret then invited Roussel to the Palace of the Louvre in France, in Paris, in the very heart of Paris, to preach uh, the gospel there. Thousands of French people came to hear Roussel, and the gospel was preached in Paris. But most of the Catholics in Paris did not like this idea of salvation by faith being preached. A couple of years after this uh, massive upheaval in Paris, uh, the Protestants in France made a serious error in judgment. They looked around and they saw how quickly the movement was spreading in England. Uh, by this time, Tyndale's Bible was out. They saw how quickly it was spreading in the Netherlands, um, how quickly it was spreading all across Christendom, even in Scotland. And yet here in France, it was crawling along. They decided that they were going to take France by storm. What they did was they wrote a little pamphlet. Uh, it basically denounced the mass in the strongest terms. 
It was ill-advised and unkind and probably akin to shooting themselves in the foot. Not only did they distribute these pamphlets, they also turned them into massive placards and they posted these placards all over France. They posted them on every single wall and door. They posted it on the doors of every cathedral and one bright spark even posted it on the king's personal bedchamber the door of the king's personal bedchamber. It was foolish to say the least. The next morning when Parisians, when French men and women woke up, there were these offensive uh, placards all over their neighborhoods. It caused an outroar and it caused serious outrage among the citizenry. The king especially was annoyed because he thought, how dare someone come to my private chambers and post this insulting uh, piece of rhetoric against what I believe in. Uh, the Bible tells us in Ephesians 14, 15, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way unto him who is the head into Christ. But Jesus also told his disciples in John 8, 32, that you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. This combination of speaking the truth in love is an essential component when we are speaking about Jesus and about the truths in the Bibles. And this was not something uh, that the French reformers had learned. Their ill-advised move uh, in speaking something that was true but in an offensive way caused a massive wave of persecution to sweep over France. In fact, uh, it, it also caused a rift between Francis and Margaret. Their relationship, which had been so tight and so close, was fractured as a result of Francis's adamant determination to destroy uh, the Reformation in France. Francis uh, got one of his close lieutenants to go door to door and they dragged Protestants out into the streets and burnt them on the street corners. Margaret refused to accept this and some historians believe that their relationship was never the same again as a result of this. In the aftermath of what was known as the Affair of the Placards, Francis I of France decided to do something radical. He decided that he had indulged the doctrine of the Reformation long enough in France. He uh, declared a national day of mourning. And it was probably one of the lowest points in the history of the Kingdom of France. What he did was, he dressed himself as a penitent, uh, which was basically in black with a taper or a candle. And he led a procession through the streets of France, um, including his household, all the princes of the blood, including Margaret's husband, uh, the King of Navarre, followed in his train. He uh, went uh, with this taper and at every street corner, as he passed, there was a pyre uh, with a reformist or Protestant strapped to the stake. And as the king passed, uh, the reformist or the Protestant was set in flames. He went all the way to the Cathedral of Notre Dame where he confessed the sins of the nation and recommitted France to uh, Catholicism. It was a day of awful bloodshed. Notably absent among the profession, uh, procession that day was Margaret. Everybody else in Francis's family and household was present, including his wife, his second wife by that time, including Margaret's own husband, and yet Margaret was absent. In the letters between Francis and Margaret after that date, historians note a decided strain in their relationship. Even though uh, a few months after this incident, they were reconciled, they didn't write to each other for a few months. And the correspondence that picked up after that had a decided strain in it. About a year or so later, their relationship resumed uh, but it's really interesting, historians believe that it was never the same again. This rift, this breach between uh, this beloved brother and sister was caused uh, because of their differing views on faith. In John chapter 2, Jesus demonstrates the same set of priorities uh, that Margaret herself demonstrated. Uh, in John 2, 1 to 2, the Bible says, On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, and Jesus also was invited to the wedding and his disciples. Now, most likely, the wedding was for a distant relative of some sort because Jesus was invited, and Mary seemed to be working behind the scenes to make the event a success. While Jesus was at the wedding, they discovered that they had run out of wine. Now, uh, 
this was a considerable problem given the fact that wine was an important part of a, of a wedding celebration. Jesus' mother found out that the guests had run out of wine and she comes to her son and she tells him the situation, hoping that he would use his power as the son of God to do something about it. Now, Jesus was respectful to his mother, but he also understood that he was not under his mother's authority, but under God's authority. That was a valuable lesson that Margaret had to learn. She loved her brother, but she came to a point in her life where she realized that her first allegiance was to God. It was a painful realization, but a necessary one. Jesus also understood this distinction and in uh, his response to his mother, he basically told her um, that he would not be doing what she wanted him to do. Instead, he would be doing what his father in heaven wanted him to do. Uh, later, we know that uh, Jesus tells the servants to fill six large stone water jars, uh, holding about 20 to 30 gallons apiece, and he turned the water into wine. But one of the key elements of this story is that Jesus chose to say no to his mother because he understood that his entire life was consecrated to fulfilling his heavenly father's plan. That was not an easy thing to do. He loved his mother. When he was dying on the cross, he made sure that she was taken care of. And yet he didn't allow his love for his mother to detract from his loyalty to God. Jesus understood how to prioritize the relationships in his life. In John chapter 4, verse 34, Jesus says, My food is to do the will of my Father in heaven and to accomplish his work. Jesus was driven by a deep love for his Father and a deep love for us. And this is what led him to live a life in complete harmony with God's will, uh, as it was clearly revealed in Scripture. Sometimes in life, it's easy to allow our relationships to disrupt our relationship with God. It can be a family member who is not a believer, or we might be in a relationship with someone who doesn't believe in God. Either way, God wants us to be like Jesus. God wants us to love Him and to put Him first in our lives so that our relationship with Him takes precedence over every other relationship in our lives. I pray that as you think about Margaret's story, as you think about Jesus' own story, that you will choose to draw closer to Jesus and prioritize your relationship with Him through a deepening understanding of Scripture. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the story of Margaret of Navarre and for the way she reflected the priorities that Jesus himself reflected in putting you first in everything that she, uh, she did. Lord, help us to be uh, like Jesus. Help us to be like Margaret. Help us to put you first in our lives, Father, uh, so that you can have the proper place in our lives and that a relationship with you can help us to grow um, and deepen our, our, our walk with God, but also to grow in all the other areas of our life. Father, thank you for hearing this prayer. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.